Being a Christian means that giving thanks is just part of who we are because we know something. We know that we have been forgiven much, and God has instilled within us this heart of gratitude. And so for the Christian, for the follower of Jesus Christ, and prayerfully that's everyone within the sound of my voice here this morning, but for all of us who follow Jesus, there is a certain disposition of gratitude or an attitude of gratitude that is a non-negotiable. For example, I remember preaching this passage one time, and this is the, not the passage that I'm going to preach this morning, but I love this passage in Colossians chapter 3. It just drops this little nugget. Listen for it. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. I love the way the Bible just assumes that giving thanks is just something that Christians ought to do. It's no wonder why this time of the year in particular during Thanksgiving, that there is an undercurrent of uh, religion, an undercurrent of Christianity that undergirds this entire season. Because you remember the story of when the pilgrims came over, and uh, of course there was that first Thanksgiving with all the Indians, but remember the reason that they came over. They came over because they were seeking a pure form of religion and what they knew. And so they came over to pursue freedom of religion. And because of that, you and I have every reason to give thanks. But what about those times and seasons, maybe in your life, where yeah, you don't have really a lot of reasons to give thanks, or at least that's the way that you feel? You feel like that, I really am not very thankful. I can remember when Katie and I were in college and we were dating, we sort of adopted this mantra of all through our our season, and that is praise God. Praise God. No matter what, praise God. Even if things are bad, you praise God. If things are good, you praise God. You praise God regardless, because as Christians, we, through Jesus Christ, have every reason to give thanks. Now, listen to me carefully. What do we confess as Christians? We confess, listen carefully, we confess that eternity has broke into our present time. Our disposition, our whole life is now shifted towards the reality that Jesus Christ has brought to us. Remember who He is. After all, you will call His name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And so we have this, now that eternity has broken into our present reality, we have every reason to give thanks. Now, it doesn't mean, for example, if I fall off the stage, I'm not going to get up and go, thank the Lord that happened. No, that's not it. But we say we have a reason no matter what happens. Thank you, I broke my leg. Thank the Lord. That's just wonderful. No, we have every reason to give thanks because God is good, and He is changing things. God is good no matter the circumstances. So if you're here this morning, and maybe if you, if you have in your little, uh, your I don't mean to call you little, but uh, your scale, you're, you have a thanksgiving meter, and maybe you're running low on thanks. I want to encourage you this morning from, uh, from Isaiah chapter 12, and I want us to look at that entire passage, and I want us to develop reasons that we should give thanks. So take your Bible and join me in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 12, and in Isaiah chapter 12, we're going to develop from these six verses, seven reasons why we ought to give thanks. Let's read the Bible. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation." With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deed among the peoples, proclaim that His name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. 
And I hope you're taking notes this morning because these seven points are going to come at you rather quickly. And the reason why we want to take notes is because, as Adrian Rogers used to say, the weakest ink is stronger than the strongest memory. And so hopefully you'll have an opportunity as you have your Thanksgiving lunch, maybe some of you a little later, you'll be able to talk about some of these truths, and you'll have an arsenal full of reasons for you to give thanks. So number one, write this down. We have a reason to give thanks because in Jesus Christ, we have a reason to hope. Now listen, Jesus Christ has come wherever you are, in the middle of your circumstances, He has infused your circumstance with eternity. Every man, woman, boy, and girl within the sound of my voice, every one of us, we are all made for eternity. And we'll either spend that eternity with God or we'll spend it without God. And you say, what's the difference between the two? Listen, faith in Jesus Christ. That's the difference between an eternity with God and eternity without God faith in Jesus Christ. But there is this rhythm that comes even in the Old Testament, this constant rhythm that comes that infuses our present reality. There's this forward progression of the text, and even where we are right now, there's this forward march that we have, this anticipation of a better world that's coming. The Bible says in verse 1, you will say, in that day. Do you see that word, in that day? You know what that does for us? That little phrase, in that day, shows us that there is a better day coming. And that better day that's coming, listen, how can you be so confident to say that? Listen carefully. I can confidently say that because Jesus Christ, He Himself, is the guarantee of the better day that's coming. You say, what do you mean? Jesus Christ, right now, He's alive. Right now. There's a body in heaven. Jesus Christ's body. It's a resurrected body. And here's what He's promised. He says, wherever I am, that's where you're going to be. And here's what He has said. No matter what your current day is, no matter what your present circumstances are, even if you're here this morning and you're so far in sin that you can't see up from down, you're so into addiction, you're so far in debt, you're so far, whatever your circumstances are, you have a hope that has been guaranteed through the indestructible life of Jesus Christ, that there is a better day that's coming. And listen carefully. The Bible says you will say in that day. And what are we going to say? I give thanks to you, O Lord. What do we say? God, you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. But I want you to do something. Hopefully you have your Bible here or you'll be able to follow along here. This is not on the screen. Go back to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. What's the day that Isaiah chapter 12 is referring to? Well, Isaiah 6 through 12 really has all just one theme, this theme of restoration, this theme of hope. And I'll get to Isaiah chapter 6 in just a moment, but you remember where Isaiah 6 begins. Isaiah 6 begins with this vision of the Lord, high and exalted. This is the vision that Jesus Christ has secured for us. Why do you think, for example, it's, a, it's, a, it's for purpose that you see at the end of the Gospels, and I'm getting off track. I'll get back on track in just a minute, but this is good. Just listen. There's, a, there's this anticipation or there's this picture that all of the Gospels have of the, all these men and women and boys and girls looking up. Why are they doing that? Because they see the Lord high and lifted up. And that's the vision that Isaiah in some way saw. And that's the vision that we ever get to have before us because it's a vision that God gives us. He secures for us through, again, the indestructible life of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who is absolutely for us. And because of Him, we have every reason to hope. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 11 says. There shall come forth from the uh, stump from, excuse me, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a Nasser, a branch, a Nazarene, a branch from its roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsels and might, the Spirit of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eye sees or decide disputes by what his ear hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide the equity for the meek of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will kill the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt of his waist. 
faithfulness to the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the fatted calf together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall place his hand or put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy. And all my holy mountain says the, for, the, uh, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And in that day, you see, and then this continues, that blessed hope that we have that has been, again, guaranteed because Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death. He took my sins, your sins, and the sins of the whole world. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ took the wage of that sin. The wages of sin is death, and death through its worst at Jesus. Jesus stood on the cross, arms wide open, and he looked in the face of death, and he said, have your worst with me. And death did. Death killed our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. But is that the end of the story? Absolutely not. What happened three days later? Up from the grave he arose. You see, Christian, why do you have a reason to thanks? Because you have a better tomorrow that's awaiting you. You know, there's something that I constantly hear. We have to move on to point number two. But there's something that I constantly hear, especially in our post-election cycle, in our post-election world. You know what we all want? more than a better economy, more than the avoidance of war, what do we all want? We want peace. Don't you just want someone to come into the chaos and say, peace be still? We have the assurance that the one who brings peace is the Prince of Peace. The one who brings peace is himself a God who is for us. You see, you have every reason in Jesus Christ to hope. Look at verse 2. This is the second reason that we give thanks. We have, number two, a secure salvation. Look at the end of the first little section there in in verse 1. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Now, I want you to mark this in your Bible. God is my salvation. Listen carefully. Jesus Christ is not just one answer among many answers. He's just not the best answer amongst other answers. Jesus Christ is the only answer. Now, I don't know if some of you heard me there. I want to make sure that you did. Jesus Christ is not just the best answer. Jesus Christ is the only answer. He himself is my salvation. But look at how the the verb changes here in chapter 2, or excuse me, verse 2 of chapter 12. He has become my salvation. Jesus Christ is your only hope. But I just want to humbly ask you, is he the only hope that you have? You see, Jesus Christ is your salvation. He is more ready to save you and make you his very own than you are even willing to ask him to do it. But you have to come to him. You have to receive him as Lord. You have to lay down your self-justifying. You have to lay down your self-righteousness. You have to lay down yourself and you say, simply to thy cross I cling, nothing in my hand I bring. Has Jesus Christ become your salvation. Not your mother's salvation, not your grandmother's salvation, not your daddy's salvation, not the preacher's salvation, not the church's salvation, but do you have, listen carefully, do you have a personal, intimate relationship with God? Do you know Him? Have you made yourself known to Him? Are you hiding something from him? There's no reason to really hide anyway. You know what the cross of Jesus Christ says? Totally accepted. Totally forgiven. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus Christ says, you come just as you are to me. And I will give you my life. You give me your life. 
Jesus says, and I'll give you my life as your very own. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you get to say, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. You get to say, I have such a secure salvation. Jesus says again in Isaiah, he says, I have you inscribed on the palm of my hand. That's right where you are. You are ever before the Lord. He has moved heaven and earth. You think about the cross. He has moved heaven and earth. Literally, this is the reason why uh, whoever it was, I I can't call his name right now. You'll tell me later, I know. Uh, The guy who split time, and he missed it by four years, but anyway, nobody's perfect except Jesus. We have time itself in our Western calendars split by before Christ and the year of our Lord, Anno Domine. We have this, even if you call it CE and BCE, for some of you who are academics out there, guess what? You still split it by the indestructible life of Jesus Christ. He himself has secured our salvation, and our complete hope is in this Jesus who has come for us, who has reoriented all of reality, even time itself, so that we could explore His goodness, so that we could become His very own, so that He could make us as He is. Look at the results of verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You hear this? If God is your salvation, you don't have any reason to be afraid. No matter what kind of monsters live in your closet, no matter what's lurking under the bed, the Lord is light. And he sees all, and he knows all. I can remember as a little boy, I used to have a lot of nightmares. And I can remember my mother coming in and saying, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Repeat that, Andy. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in you. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Listen, Jesus Christ, and it's not something at a distance. Please hear this. Jesus Christ doesn't just simply say, all right, now you just have to trust me. He demonstrates that trust. Jesus, remember, he doesn't just say, go that way. What's he say? Follow me. Jesus Christ will never lead you anywhere that he himself has not already been. You can completely trust in him. And he has secured a salvation ready for you to receive. Let's move on. Look at verse 3. And I love this imagery here. Hopefully you'll get it. A lot of good things happen by wells in the Bible, and this is no different here. Verse 3, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Oh, there is an abundant supply with our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you need this morning? You need peace. He has an abundant supply of peace. You need forgiveness. He has an abundant supply of forgiveness. Do you need hope? Every hope is His, and He gives it to you. What do you need? There's nothing that you need that Jesus Christ does not satisfy. What's the Bible say? My God shall supply all my needs. How does He supply those needs? In Christ Jesus. You think of something. You think of something. And the Bible says, One ups you and says, to him who is able to do far above and beyond what we even ask or think, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever and ever. This God has made himself available to you. And he says, if you're thirsty, just come to me. Come to me. It won't cost you anything. There is an abundant supply of love, an abundant supply of acceptance, an abundant supply of relief, an abundant supply of grace, an abundant supply. You will never exhaust This God who has made himself available to you, even if you mock him, he's still available to you. Even if you spit on him, he's still available to you. Even if you scourge him, nail him to a cross, which all of us are guilty of. The reason Jesus died was because of my sins, your sins, and the sins of the whole world. And what do we see Jesus saying as he's hanging from the cross? Father, forgive them. You see? The well that he has of salvation to which we draw from, it is limitless. Oh, if we would just tap into this. Why are you worried? 
Why are you concerned? Why do you go around moping? Why do you wonder if things will… You have this absolute hope and assurance from this abundant supply drawn from the blood of Emmanuel's veins. There is a fountain, remember we sing, filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stains. What do you need this morning? What is it that you need? You need a relationship with God. That's the one thing that you need above all things. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter how much money you don't have. Doesn't matter if your team's winning or if your team's not winning. Who do you have? You have this Jesus who stands above time, above circumstances, and He calls you to Himself. And the reason He does that is because He loves you so much. And some of you need to hear that. Some of you really need to hear this. That there's not one thing you can do to make God love you any more than He already does. Did you know that? There's not one thing you can do to make Him love you any more than He already does. And listen to this. There's not one thing you can do to make Him love you any less. You say, how can you say that? Because of Romans chapter 5 that says, while we were still sinners, not when we had it out, not because of some hidden potential, oh, Andy's going to be used to do this, or uh, they're going to be used to do this. It's while we were still sinners, while no one else loved us, while we were undeserving of any love, God enriched in His love. The grace, Ephesians says, which He lavished upon us in the beloved Jesus Christ, He gives us His whole life as our very own to be lived no matter our circumstances, no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through. You have an untouchable disposition, an untouchable disposition, not to worry, not to get angry, but to give thanks, not to be concerned, but to give thanks. And see, this is the reason that we have. And that doesn't mean that you're just going to go around, like I said, you fall down a stair and you can say, thank God, that's over with. That's not the kind of disposition, but it's a disposition that looks at your circumstances and says, I am not going to be defined, listen carefully, I'm not going to be defined and I'm not going to be defeated by my circumstances because of Jesus. And because of Jesus, He has what I need. And, I, and He makes Himself fully available to me. You will never pray and God say, can you come back tomorrow? That'll never happen. You will never find him unready or unwilling to meet all your needs. Well, there's another reason. And the other reason that we have is found again in verse 3. We have assurance of his plans. It says, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. You know what God's doing for you? This is Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. God, the will of God for you is sanctification. You say, what is God's plan for my life? And he has a plan for every one of us. And I can put a blanket statement on every one of those individual particular plans that God has, and I can simply say this, listen, God's will for you is that you become more and more like Jesus. Right now, Romans chapter 8 says that it is predestined. In other words, you can't do anything about it. It is predestined. You can resist it, but with consequence. It is predestined for you to be conformed into the image of His beloved Son. So, you know what God's doing in that circumstance? He is making you look more and more like Jesus. In every hurt, in every joy, in every circumstance, He is preparing you for this inheritance that is yours through Jesus Christ, this eternal weight of glory that's ready to be revealed to you in the last time. We look at our world and we look and we see wars and rumors of world wars and uncertainty, but we again have this unshakable assurance. We have this unshakable assurance that we know what the world's coming to. You say, what is the world coming to? It's coming to Jesus. Jesus Christ, He's going to come and He's going to fulfill the prayer on our lips that He has put His prayer on our lips. You remember what it is? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And while we're here, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts because we need you, Lord. We need to remember, lest we forget, that we are not simply defined by this horizontal reality of what's in front of us. No, instead, like old Isaiah and like the disciples on that day, we have this glorious beautiful vision of this Lord. We not only have this horizontal horizon of what's here, but now we have this vertical horizon fixed that you know what it says? Listen, and I've said this to some of you before, and this is finally catching heart in some of you because you've said it back to me. Christians, we don't simply say it is what it is. That's a defeatist attitude. We don't simply say it is what it is. You know what we say? Whatever it is, is not what it's going to be. Whatever it is, is not what it's going to be. There is a horizontal reality that we're all fixed by, but we're not transfixed by them. We are transfixed by this beautiful vision of this God who is coming. This God who will raise every low spot and make it level. He'll take every difficult hill and he'll help us climb it. This God gives us the assurance of His plans, and the assurance of His plans, again, are all centered on Jesus Christ. The assurance of what God is doing and what He desires to do is seen simply through the indestructible life of Jesus Christ. And by faith, listen, by faith through grace, you can have His very life as your very own. That's what the whole sealing of the Holy Spirit's all about. Jesus Christ gives His life, as I've said before, He gives His life not simply for you on the cross, and He did that, but on the day of Pentecost, He gave His life to you. Now you're sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit, and you have the assurance as you walk through this world, no matter the circumstances, no matter the diagnosis, no matter what the bill collectors call and say, no matter what happens, you have the assurance of this God whose promises know no expiration date. Times change, Hebrews 1, seasons change. With God, I love that image in Hebrews 1, and it's taken right from Isaiah, by the way. He says he takes it and he just simply rolls it up like a garment. Imagine how powerful this God is, who can take all of our circumstances, and for us, boy, they break us down. For the circumstances that we face, boy, they are all encompassing. They cover us up. But for God, he sent, it's for Him, He just rolls it up. It's just part of my plan. And there's some things, and some of you in particular, all of us have things that have happened in our life that we don't understand. And oftentimes we're trying to search for the reason but we may never know the reason this side of heaven why things are the way they are. But whatever the circumstance, listen carefully. No matter death, no matter diagnosis, no matter some other D word that I'll think about between now and the next service, whatever circumstance, we have the absolute assurance of this God who never changes, of this God who's always the same, of this God who my life is going to expire, but His promises outlast me, and His promises will outlast you. Some of you are taking all the stock that you have, and you're placing it in something temporary. You have something better to live for, not some temporary assurance, but an absolute assurance, because Jesus Christ is fully alive. Where well, we're going to have to move fast. Look at verse 5. Sing praises to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. In other words, we have a message to share. And that message that we have to share is not just simply for Starkville, Mississippi. It's not just for Mississippi or the Southeast. It's not just for the United States. It's for the whole entire world. Do you realize the message that we get to share? And listen, I can share it to you, but if you'll share it with somebody, then my one gets multiplied by 500, and that 500 gets multiplied by another 500, and then that 500 gets… You see how the multiplication happens? All of a sudden, we have this strong message to share of hope because the whole world needs it. 
As you are sitting with your family, no doubt you have some of your family this weekend or maybe even today that they need to hear this hope. They, don't need, they need to not only hear it, let me say this clearly, they not only need to hear it, they need to see it. So some of you, you, you're thinking about that person that's going to come over to your house and you start loading that Bible gun. You know, you start thinking, here they come. I can't wait. I'm going to throw this verse at them. I'm gonna, when they get here, I can't wait to tell them this. A message to share doesn't just simply mean what we say. It means how we live. I can remember a philosophy professor one time. He said, I just wonder what would happen if the world just put a mute button on Christianity and watched our messaging instead of listened to the words that we say. Because I know you're like me. I can make my mouth say a lot of things. But you want to know who I really am? Go ask these two on the the front row here. Go ask my Adelie and my Titus. Go ask Katie and Ezra who are in the nursery today. You go ask them. They'll tell you who Andy Brown really is. We have a message to share. But listen, that message desires to consume us, to take hold of us. That message is not just simply for Sunday. That message is not simply for your Bible reading time. It's a message for all time. And that doesn't mean that you get it perfect. But it it means that you live a certain direction where you constantly are pointing people not to look how great I am, but look how good this God is. We have a message to share. We also have a song to sing. Look at this in verse 6. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion. Shout and and sing for joy. In other words, this message of thanks, you know what it should do for us? It should move us. Move us a little bit. Some people have this idea that when we come to church, you know, we're supposed to sit here and, mmm, that's good. Mmm. Groan a little bit like the man, the man grumbled. "Mm, uh, uh, uh." But we have a, such a song that God has put in our heart. Something that has to be expressed in the way that we live. And my prayer is that that song that we get to sing will make its way into your heart so that you will erupt with gratitude, that you will think about all that God has done, that you will constantly live with Him, and that you will have this song that is in your heart, this disposition that's contagious, this song that erupts, this truth that moves you beyond your circumstance. Somebody looks at you and says, what in the world is wrong with this person? Don't they realize all this negative? Don't they realize what's going on? Are they unmoved by it? No, we're not unmoved by it. We're just not matched by it because we have a matchless confession that Jesus Christ is Lord and He is taking all of our circumstances, all of our situations, and He is reorienting them towards His glory. We have a song to sing. It's not that we're unmoved. Even Jesus wept. It's not that we're stoic. We have a song that God has given us. And the reason He's given us, the last and final thing, and this is the best part. Verse 6. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. Oh, here we go. You ready? For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Here's the greatest reason for us to give thanks. We give thanks because God is with us. And you know what that means? It means he didn't make a mistake when he saved you. He knew exactly what he was doing. And some of you, I pray that truth will grab hold of you this morning. You say, Pastor, if you only knew. Well, listen, I don't have to know. God knows. And while you were still a sinner, Jesus Christ gave his life for you. And here's what we know. This God who is with us, who has made himself available to us personally, and I think about some of you in particular, your religion is just simply right here. This is as far as it gets. Your religion is just simply right here. It goes no further. You have this blessed assurance that Jesus is yours, not just for today, not just for this moment, but for every moment. And you get to live your life always with Him. In other words, you get to have a personal relationship with God. And here's what we know. This God who's with us, now that He's with us. Remember what He said in Hebrews 13, 5? Remember what He said in Matthew 28? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
And listen to me, dear friend. Again, we go back to that first verse. And I humbly want to ask you, is Jesus Christ your Savior? Have you trusted him as your Lord? Because I'll be honest, if you don't have Jesus, you may give thanks, but that thanks that you give is temporary. That thanks that you give will not last. Only Jesus Christ gives you a reason to give thanks. That's beyond your present circumstances because Jesus Christ has brought an eternity that one day all of us will inhabit, an eternity to us. And now you have to choose. And for some of you, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the way that you give thanks is by first confessing Him as your Lord.